another phrase of Yeats's, one of those catch cries of the clown that amounts in the long run to little more than the squealing of various interests as they vest themselves a little deeper in the shallow politics of their time. In truth, the humanities were in crisis long ago, a crisis of self-belief, in fact, which was most obviously enacted in the advent of so-called theory and literature departments in the 1980s, and their heart buckled and failed under the pressure of that doubt. Since then, theory may have lost a good deal of its luster, but it's fair to say that the non-literary has set the terms for much of what passes as professional literary study, and by now it commands all the powers of patronage that can guarantee its complete victory. How else can it be, for instance, that projects announcing themselves as interdisciplinary routinely attract special funding from those bodies whose opinion matters to university man managers, as though it were somehow more advanced, more definitely progressing than purely disciplinary study. It is indeed progressing somewhere. It is progressing decisively away from literary criticism. In the process, it may actually put an end to various purely disciplinary areas. Perhaps this is just as well. For criticism's involvement with academe has never been entirely a happy one, and is in any case not of very long-standing in historical terms. Great poetry was written long before there were professors to study it, and there's no reason at all to believe that it requires them in order to happen again in the future. Universities will increasingly find themselves obliged to avoid activities that are essentially disinterested ones, and the humanities who have decided for some time that their studies could not on any account be disinterested must expect to have their interests presented to them by those whose money pays the bills. True, many in the humanities dislike the politics of these newly imperious interests, but the essential point that scholars were to be like Yeats's rhetoricians, who are motivated by the crowd they have won or may win, was conceded by the academy itself emphatically and ruthlessly long ago. All of this at least leaves the field clear for criticism to do its job. A job not all that different from the description offered by Matthew Arnold in 1869, when he claimed that the task of his book, Culture, Culture and Anarchy, was to recommend it as the great help out of our present difficulties, culture being a pursuit of our total perfection by means of getting to know on all the matters which most concern us the best, which has been thought and said in the world, and through this knowledge, turning a stream of fresh and free thought upon our stock, notions and habits, which we now follow staunchly, but mechanically. Once professional learning has been systematised and reduced to nothing more than a set of stock notions and habits, fresh and free thought must make its home elsewhere. One must not suppose, though, that fresh and free thought is ever welcomed by or accommodating to the dominant power structures of its time. Certainly, freshness and freedom have long been lacking from the major humanities disciplines. On both sides of the Atlantic, the humanities may be making a lot of pain and noise at present, but the essence of their complaint is that they're not loved enough. It would seem never to have occurred to the most vocal mourners that their disciplines did not come into being in order that they should be loved, nor indeed that the society from whose instinctive values including the values that attach to tradition and to art, they have declared themselves so completely apart from, and to which they remain so insistently superior, has truly no obligation to offer them its affection. When what were once disciplines of thought 
and study, conceived and practiced in terms of disinterested knowledge, decide that their success is measured by prestige, peers and patronage, and that their prime task is to interrogate their own past, along with the past and the present of their fostering societies, and the fundamental shared values of aesthetic, social and civil traditions, then they have no right to be surprised when those who foot the bill tire of their interrogations and ask some hard questions of their own. Perhaps the lesson to be drawn from this is that quarrels need to be wisely chosen. The quarrel with others that Yeats calls rhetoric is not a thing from which he himself can claim to be a part. And from early until late his, in his writing career, he knowingly entered and instigated quarrels with a fully rhetorical commitment. But the quarrel with ourselves that he identifies with poetry is not something merely quarrelsome, not just the picking of public fights. Ideally for Yeats, and we should remember that all good poetry can imagine though no poetry can actually achieve a state of ideal perfection, the purest quarrels are the most nearly disinterested ones. And it's these which can bring energy into the writing of verse. Just before the composition of Peramica, Silencia Lunae, Yeats published his poem On Woman, which is less praise of femininity than an aspiration towards it. May God be praised for woman that gives up all her mind. A man may find in no man a friendship of her kind that covers all he has brought as with her flesh and bone, nor quarrels with a thought because it is not her own. Obviously, there are dynamics of gendered imagination at work here, which would be foolish to deny, but for now, it'd be worth concentrating on the opposition which is being set up in these lines between friendship and quarrel and the way in which this is related to what Yeats calls thought. It may be that thought is one thing, the only thing perhaps, which poetry and rhetoric have as a common property, but what they do with it is entirely different. For Yeats, we need to remember, each was still a kind of quarrel, man's work to return to the gendered terms of that poem. In 1916 to 17, around the same time as both the poem On Woman and Per Amica's composition, Yeats was attempting a prose autobiography. Here, the ability to cover thought as with flesh and bone that apparently quintessential female power is attributed to none other than Yeats' sometime flatmate, Arthur Simmons. Here's Yeats in his attempted autobiography. That night at 12 o'clock, I said to Simmons, who had just come in, did I ever tell you about Maud gone? Until two or three in the morning, I spoke of my love for her. <clears throat> it must have been quite an evening. Of all the men I have known, he was the best listener. He could listen as a woman listens, never meeting one's thought as a man does with a rival thought, but taking up what one had said and changing it, giving it, as it were, flesh and bone. The thoughts here clearly run into the poem, whose ideal of sympathy as against quarrel finds the same metaphor of flesh and bone giving its covering to thought. But Yeats knows better than to think that he can find poetry in this provision of bodily form, however much it might be needed and desired. Sex is at issue here, undoubtedly, and one thing that Yeats is asking himself at this point is whether sex, even with Maud gone, is enough to, to still the quarrelsome impetus for from and in poetry. Though the prose memoir names Maud, all oh, my old love had returned, he writes, the poem opts instead of Maud for Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Though pedantry denies, it's plain the Bible means 
that Solomon grew wise while talking with his queens, yet never could, although they say he counted grass, count all the praises due when Sheba was his lass, when she the iron wrought, or when from the smithy fire it shuddered in the water, harshness of their desire that made them stretch and yawn, pleasure that comes with sleep, shudder that made them one. That shudder which prefigures the climactic and catastrophic shudder in the loins of Yeats's later poem, The Leader and the Swan, is also here the shudder in water of newly made iron, a made thing. And Per Amica's remarks on poetry retrace this uncertain border between the erotic and the fabricated with the same word. Remember? Unlike the rhetoricians who get a confident voice from remembering the crowd they have won or may win, we sing amid our uncertainty and smitten even in the presence of the most high beauty by the knowledge of our solitude, our rhythm shudders. One notion which can be taken from this is the idea of made art as something that registers a deep unease along with an unstoppable compulsion in its very making. That is, ourselves would doubtless be happier and more fortunate generally, if not in a state of quarrelling. But art requires that quarrel which comes from the profoundest self-confrontation of the art in the artist. And for Yeats, this means that poetry takes the heat of the known self into the coldness of the unknown, which is also the coldness of a made form. In late statements, this has a distinctly rhetorical spin, as though it were by now a brazenly self-aware quarrel with others, as perhaps it is. And indeed, in sentences like these from 1937, it seems to be a quarrel with us, too. Because I need a passionate syntax, Yeats says, for passionate subject matter, I compel myself to accept those traditional metres that have developed with the language. Ezra Pound, Turner, Lawrence wrote admirable free verse. I could not. I would lose myself, become joyless. All that is personal soon rots. It must be packed in ice or salt. If I wrote a personal love or sorrow in free verse or in any rhythm that left it unchanged amid all its accident, I would be full of self-contempt because of my egotism and indiscretion, and I foresee the boredom of my reader. I must choose a traditional stanza. Even what I alter must seem traditional. Talk to me of originality, and I will turn on you with rage. I am a crowd. I am a lonely man. I am nothing. Ancient salt is best packing. With the many things that may be said about this, I will content myself here with just the one. Yeats is utterly, utterly at odds with much of our own received wisdom about both self and form in poetry. Damning not only the poets and critics who believe that freedom of form equates with a desirable freedom of personal expression, but also those poets and critics who think that form is something simply there to be used, like an item in a toolbox. Today, many poets still think of themselves approvingly as members of a crowd with politics and cultural correctness on full display. And others still announce themselves as lonely men and women with their lives and family histories, however humdrum as all-engrossing subjects. Fewer, many fewer, are serious about being nothing. Only Yeats in his time, and only Yeats in ours, 
can honestly say all three. I am a crowd. I am a lonely man. I am nothing.